Hello, uh, it's Tom here again with another uh, presentation for advanced medical care topic of the Graduate Diploma in Paramedicine. This time we're dealing with management of the poison patient. Initially I was going to look at just one type of uh, poison case, but there were so many that I found interesting that I found it quite hard to stick to just one. So I'm doing three, so hopefully that's okay. Uh, just a presentation overview, we're going to discuss the general management of a poison patient and then we're going to look at some specific cases of poisoning including lithium toxicity, strychnine poisoning and ethylene glycol poisoning and within those three we'll discuss the epidemiology and the pharmacology or pathophysiology uh, or physiology even of some of these poisons as well as the assessment and management of these cases. Obviously, we need to follow our usual process of the primary survey with danger response, airway, breathing, circulation and disability. But danger is a particularly important one. So we need to be suspicious of two or more altered conscious state or symptomatic patients at one scene, because this could be suggestive of an environmental exposure risk. So we don't want to be the canary, seek as much information prior to entry and consider specialist services such as special operations or the fire service um, if you're concerned, don't make yourself a patient because you'll be of no use to anyone and it's also quite embarrassing. Um, generally, pre-hospital care is mostly supportive in nature in the absence of a, a, a specific antidote or reversal agent. We really only have atropine and naloxone, although you could consider oxygen, I suppose, an antidote uh, in the context of a carbon monoxide poisoning, I suppose. Some services may carry amyl nitrate or sodium nitrite for uh, hydrogen cyanide poisoning too, but we generally don't carry a, a lot of specific antidotes for poisoning cases. As a general rule, we also need to obtain as much information about the poison as possible. Um, in South Australia, we can call the Poisons Information Centre on 131126. We need to know exactly what the chemical or chemicals um, ingested or exposed to are, what time it was ingested and how much. Um, poisons information can provide really an excellent um, source of info for clinicians, including things like secondary exposure risks and signs and symptoms to look out for, in addition to advice for management of the patient. Obviously, as much information that we can get in the pre-hospital setting will make the job easier for those in the emergency department. So let's look at the first one, lithium carbonate. It's been used as a mood stabiliser in bipolar affective disorder and acute mania since the 1970s. Uh, but the use of lithium as a medication probably started in the 1800s where something called lithia water was used to manage gout and mania. Eventually higher concentrations uh, led to the introduction of lithium carbonate tablets. In 2016, uh, in the United States, there were uh, 6,901 cases of lithium toxicity reported uh, to the American Association of Poison Control Centers, so it's fairly common. In a 1997 to 2013 study that looked at a cohort of lithium um, prescribed patients, 96 out of 1300 had a lithium level serum level greater than 1.5 millimoles per litre and of those 34 percent needed uh, intensive care unit uh, admission uh, and 17 percent needed hemodialysis there were no deaths um, but there were an, some uh, acute kidney injuries but no sustained kidney disease so let's look at the pharmacology and the kinetics of uh, lithium. You can see the chemical structure of lithium there on the right. As with so many other drugs, my favourite fa phrase in pharmacology is the exact mechanism of action remains unknown. We think that it decreases intracellular inositol, um, which might cause the mood stabilisation aspect. We also know that it inhibits glycogen synthase kinase 3 which has an important role in neuroplasticity, in neuroprotection, and in energy metabolism within the cell. We know that lithium is a cation and it could behave like sodium and potassium, which means it might affect ion transport and neuronal action potentials. It may also release serotonin from the hippocampus, 
in uh, the pharmacodynamic side of things. It's got a high bioavailability. And once it's ingested, uh, it, it reaches peak blood levels in about one to two hours in the immediate release formulation, in about four to six hours in the sustained release uh, formulation. But generally, uh, if a patient has taken a large uh, ingestion of lithium in a, an acute overdose, it can uh, take 12 hours or greater um, for peak blood levels to be reached. It's low protein binding, which means that it's quite vulnerable to being dialyzed. And it's nearly entirely renally excreted unchanged, which means that its toxicity can be impacted by renal failure. Lithium has also got a narrow therapeutic index and it needs monitoring. So many of these patients who take uh, regular lithium will have uh, ch their levels checked from time to time, especially in older or other at-risk patients where kidney function can be impaired. ...of a lithium carbonate overdose. There are different types of overdose. You have your acute or excessive intake uh, which can be due to an intentional or accidental uh, ingestion, uh, usually a massive ingestion of tablets, which can be uh, usually the signs of overdose will be seen in anywhere from 10 to 15 sustained release tablets. Or you can have an acute or chronic uh, overdose, which is usually related to impaired excretion. So this is seen in patients that, that really can't clear the lithium out of their body. Uh, and either don't adjust their dosage, so if you've got a patient that has worsening renal function and is taking a regular dosage of lithium, but because of impaired clearance, that's building up in toxic levels. So that's especially common in elderly people with a decreased glomerular filtration rate. But anything that can impact renal function like dehydration or febrile illness can cause an acute or chronic overdose. So essentially any sodium or volume depletion of any origin can cause toxicity. Chronic lithium therapy can cause uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus as well, which can also worsen renal function and, and then worsen lithium toxicity. But at the end of the day, we don't really know how lithium works. So we don't really know what, how it causes its side effects um, in overdose. But given that it's a cation, it may be related to ionic shifts and hence fluid movements and bradycardias. assessment, the signs and symptoms of lithium overdose, they're almost quite similar in a way to a parasympathetic activation. You have gastrointestinal symptoms which include persistent nausea, vomiting and diarrhea which usually starts within one hour of uh, an acute ingestion and the volume depletion seen from the gastrointestinal symptoms can worsen the toxicity due to impaired clearance. Cardiac wise, usually the symptoms there are non-specific to lithium toxicity and not usually life threatening, but you can see T wave flattening, which can be normal in patients being treated with lithium, as well as a prolonged QT interval and sometimes bradycardias. Neurologically, you're likely to see more specific symptoms here, such as ataxia, so an altered gait or difficulty walking, uh, a hyperreflexia, which is a heightened reflex response, nystagmus, which is the uncontrolled flickering or beating of the eyes, which is usually on a horizontal plane, and an altered GCS, which can range from something as simple as mild confusion to some drowsiness to agitation and even to delirium, interestingly enough. Um, and finally, you might also see some tremors, fasciculations and seizures as well. Some endocrine symptoms um, possible as well. It can cause hypothyroidism due to inhibition of uh, thyroid hormone synthesis but for some reason it can also sometimes co cause hyperthyroidism which can sometimes make diagnosing lithium toxicity harder because it worsens the symptoms uh, as well as well worsens the symptoms of lithium toxicity due to altering renal function but also the um, sympathomimetic side of hyperthyroidism kind of masks some of the symptoms seen in lithium uh, toxicity. It's mostly supportive care, so we're aiming to prevent distributive shock and renal failure. So therefore, we need to maintain adequate hydration. Because we're looking at um, uh, fluid loss through um, gastrointestinal symptoms usually, uh, 
Uh, isotonic 0.9% um, saline is a good choice. And typically these patients will require two to three litres of fluid um, if they're adults, and it's usually given at twice the rate of management fluid. So, you know, infuse reasonably quickly. If the patient is seizing, it's managed as per normal seizure guidelines and benzodiazepines remain the drug of choice to terminate seizures. In hospital, hemodialysis can be performed for severe cases. As we mentioned before, lithium isn't protein bound, so it's actually quite uh, easily dialyzed. So we'll need to maintain close monitoring of serum lithium levels and they drop below one and a half uh, millimoles or to a normal baseline for the patient. So the next poison that we're going to look at is one that I find quite interesting. It's called strychnine. Uh, it naturally occurs in plants and it's well known in India to occur in a, in a tree called the strychnos nux vomica tree. But it actually also is found in Australia in the more equatorial areas uh, in the Strychnos lucida and the Strychnos uh, psilosperma bushes, which are commonly found in the northern parts of the country. And it's also thought that they've been linked to being lethal to livestock. So the top image there is courtesy of uh, the CSIRO, and it shows the orange uh, strychnine-laden fruit. I wouldn't think it would be a good idea to eat those if you come across it. Um, to the right, uh, you'll see a, a, bo a bottle of uh, gopher bait. Um, strychnine has been used for a very long time uh, as a rodenticide and as its form in its form as a rodenticide you'll see it as an alkaloid it's colorless and a bitter uh, bitter powder. In Australia it's listed as a schedule 7 poison in the standard for the uniform scheduling of medicines and poisons. However, depending on what state you're in, access to the chemical can be quite varied. This is usually dependent on the volume a person intends to hold. But for example, in South Australia, a landowner outside of a township and outside of metropolitan Adelaide can legally obtain strychnine without ministerial permission if it consists as rodent bait, but there's no more than five kilograms of the rodent bait possessed and the concentration per bait doesn't exceed 0.5%. So while it's not in common use, it is still seen in commercial applications in Australia. Interestingly, it was also the murder poison of choice in the Agatha Christie books. And uh, recently in 2015, a still unidentified man was found dead in England uh, with traces of strychnine in his blood. Uh, and subsequent to that, although I don't think due to that particular case, uh, strychnine is now completely banned for sale or use in the United Kingdom since 2016. In the United States in 2015, there were 72 poisonings and one death related to strychnine. And most of these modern cases in the United States at least are seen in patients that are taking contaminated streak drugs like cocaine and heroin. Poisoning and deaths from strychnine used to be very common, especially in the United States in the 18 and 1900s, where accidental ingestions from children or uh, suicide by strychnine were, were also popular. However, it was also used in medicinal preparations because people thought it gave you a little extra pep, which really, comparing this to lithium as well, kind of just the common theme here is that it's really quite unbelievable what people would ingest in the 1800s and think it was quite fine. So since uh, the removal of strychnine from a lot of medicinal preparations, incidentally, the deaths have reduced as well. ...of muscle contraction or the neurophysiology of movement as um, prior to we look into strychnine, because this is quite an important concept to make sense of how strychnine works. So as we know, the motor unit consists of the following parts. It can consists of the lower motor neuron, which is part of the peripheral nervous system. Lower motor neurons are efferent nerves, meaning that they take a signal from or exiting, so E for efferent, E for exit, uh, the central nervous system and to the skeletal muscle. The location of the lower motor neuron soma, so the head, if you will, of the, of the neuron, determines which muscles are controlled. So if the soma is located in the brain, then the lower motor neurons will be part of the cranial nerves and control movement of the muscles in the head and neck. Uh, 
Meanwhile, if the soma is located in the spinal nerves, it will control movement for everywhere else in the body. Within the motor unit, there is a special term for the synapse of the lower motor neuron, and that's called the neuromuscular junction, where the axon terminals meet skeletal muscle cells. The image on the right, um, courtesy of the US National Institute of Mental Health, is an electron micrograph cross-section of a neuromuscular junction. If you see the markings there, T at the top of the image is the axon terminal, and M is the muscle fiber, with the arrow there pointing to uh, the junctional folds in the muscle fiber, which are kind of used to increase the surface area of the muscle fiber and enhance the collection of the neurotransmitters released from the axon terminal. When enough calcium concentrates within the axon terminal due to an excitatory action potential, it binds with acetylcholine or ACH and exocytosis occurs, resulting in the release of the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, which is the space between the axon terminal and the muscle fiber. The ACH there binds to specific nicotinic ACH receptors on the muscle fiber sodium channels, which causes a sodium influx into the cell. This depolarizes the cell enough that calcium also begins to enter which causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is like a little reservoir of calcium, to release more calcium. So as the increased intracellular calcium uh, is now present, that can be used for the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction to occur. And I won't go into the sliding filament theory um, today. So now let's look at the pathophysiology of strychnine. Where acetylcholine is responsible for the triggering of or the excitation of uh, an, a muscular action potential and muscle contraction. Glycine is one of the main inhibitory neurotransmitters. So activation of a glycine receptors which are located in the postsynaptic receptors of the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord's neuronal horn inhibits neurotransmission by causing an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So it effectively counterbalances ACH, and it's important to remember that muscles have both uh, excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Strychnine is a potent antagonist of the glycine receptor. So it's also thought to block glutamate, which is another inhibitory pathway, as well as agonize the N-methyl diaspartate receptors, which are excitatory in nature. So essentially, by blocking two of the inhibitory pathways and enhancing one of the excitatory pathways. We then have uh, unopposed muscle excitation. And as a result of that, you can then see powerful and uncontrollable muscle contractions. So strychnine works by turning off the ability to turn off your muscles. Obviously, that's gonna be pretty painful um, but more importantly, strychnine typically causes death by causing contraction of the diaphragm, which cannot be relaxed. And that means that ventilation cannot occur, causing the patient to die from asphyxiation. So really, in this way, it's actually very similar to the action of titanospasmin, which is the neurotoxin released from a tetanus infection. The lethal dose of strychnine is generally accepted to be about one to two milligrams per kilogram. who has ingested strychnine. Well, let's know a little bit more about the, the drug itself. It's rapidly absorbed and has an onset of about 10 to 20 minutes when taken orally, but it can be quicker if it's injected. It's got a half-life of about 10 to 16 hours and is uh, metabolized via the liver. So the prodromal symptoms or the symptoms that occur leading into the main pathology of the case. Uh, so the prodromal symptoms of strychnine poisoning include madriasis, which is uh, pupil dilation, anxiety, hypervigilance, and then uh, hyperreflexia and clonus, um, but especially um, tightening of the facial and neck muscles. From there, you'll see rapid onset tetany post ingestion. So the sine qua non of uh, strychnine poisoning is the awake seizure. This is the, the real hallmark of strychnine poisoning. So where a patient appears to have a tonic-clonic seizure activity, but remains fully alert during the, the process. 
Tetany itself can be waxing and waning in nature with breaks in within the tetany, even resulting in, in periods of flaccidity lasting for up to two minutes. But it's important to note that really any stimulation can trigger contractions. So we'll discuss a little bit of that later on in management. Uh, the classic kind of imagery that you'll see of strychnine poisoning and also associated with tetanospasm as well is Rhizostar donicus or the death grin which is seen in the top right image which is from an unknown source where the facial muscles uh, become so tight and spasm that the patient almost develops like a, a very painful looking grin. The bottom painting there is uh, was, is by Sir Charles Bell and was painted in 1809 and shows a patient exhibiting a sign called epistotonus, which is where the patient is essentially only resting on the heels on occiput with a rigid and arched back due to muscle contraction. Prolonged muscle contraction itself will then start to result in hyperthermia, tachycardia and lactic acidosis. If it's left unmanaged, it can also result in rhabdomyolysis and compartment syndrome. However, really, most lethal doses, uh, sorry, lethal cases are from asphyxiation, as mentioned before. Generally speaking, if a patient survives for at least five hours or more after the onset of symptoms, they'll probably have a good prognosis. So really, these symptoms can be quite difficult to pick strychnine as the cause. Um, so you, it's pretty difficult to kind of diagnose strychnine poisoning based on the symptoms alone, especially if you've got no history or known history uh, of ingestion um, that's known to the attending, attending clinicians. As mentioned before, strychnine is used to cut street drugs. So you should probably consider strychnine poisoning in patients with a recent history of uh, street drug use and this kind of epistotonic posture or the awake seizure or rise of sardonicus, for example. Well, airway management is going to be our first priority. As we mentioned, these patients will die if they can't breathe, like most patients. Um, however, given the pathology of strychnine poisoning, that is the most likely cause of death for them. Um, so while the airway management itself won't stop tetany, these patients will require significant sedation, uh, which presents its own airway and ventilation risks. Therefore, these patients will likely require rapid sequence intubation or tubing of your choice um, and mechanical ventilation un until the poison is metabolized. Management of tetany is the main challenge in these patients and frequent benzo doses will be required to, to get on top of um, the tetany. Uh, diazepam or lorazepam are preferred, but if you consider the pre-hospital setting, they're not often used in ambulances um, in non-oral formulations. So we're more likely going to have to use midazolam and the dosages of midazolam may need to be larger and closer together. Propofol is a good choice of tetany if it's refractory to benzos, but it may also be useful considering that we'll probably need to intubate the patient. So if you've got that available, that would probably be a great uh, choice of drug to assist in your intubation, but also the management of tetany. Additionally, uh, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents such as rocuronium may be useful too. You'd probably want to avoid the use of uh, sucks, for example, because that is a depolarizing muscle um, uh, block at muscular blockade agent and that would trigger a pretty severe contraction in the patient. Obviously, the nature of systemic muscle contraction is incredibly painful, so analgesia should really should be considered, especially in a non-intubated patient. Fentanyl would be ideal um, due to its quick onset of action, but also bear in mind that pain is a bit of a sympathomimetic, so that may also induce excitation, which may induce contraction as well. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to chuck some analgesia in to reduce the chance of generating an excitatory uh, action potential. Beyond this, supportive care is important. We need to give uh, IV fluids to prevent uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, as metabolic acidosis and rhabdomyolysis are known complications of this toxidrome, uh, given muscle breakdown um, seen in rhabdo will result in kidney um, failure. We need to make sure that urine output and um, is monitored and maintained. We need to try and keep the patient in a low stimulation environment, such as a dark, quiet room with very little movement. 
and that's because it's suggested that it helps reduce excitation. Obviously, this is probably near impossible in the out-of-hospital environment, but maybe consider transporting the patient with interior lights off and no sirens. Obviously. Um, but obviously, we need to uh, activate help uh, as soon as possible and notify the receiving facility as soon as possible because they'll likely need to seek advice from a toxicologist. Moving on, methanol or ethylene glycol poisoning. So methanol is found in many cleaning products, but more commonly it's probably going to be come across in um, homemade alcohol, alcoholic beverages, which are commonly known as moonshine or, or bathtub cut um, drinks. Recently, there was actually a triple fatality from methanol poisoning in uh, from homemade grappa in Queensland in about 2016. I believe the um, person who made that was recently sentenced to prison time for three counts of manslaughter. Meanwhile, ethylene glycol has multiple industrial uses, but we will most commonly see it in automotive coolant and antifreeze preparations. So on the right there, um, there is an Australian made coolant solution by the brand Nulon, which can be purchased at automotive stores and that contains a fairly high concentration of ethylene glycol. So specifically looking at ethylene glycol, there are dozens of fatal cases a year in the United States. Uh, there were over 6,000 cases of ethanol, uh, sorry, ethylene glycol poisoning in 2016 in the US. Uh, meanwhile, in Victoria, there were 18 cases uh, within Victoria alone in uh, 2011. Ethylene glycol itself has a sweet uh, odour and taste and obviously when it's prepared in coolant it has quite a colourful and attractive looking um, uh, presentation um, and hence that's the usual trigger or the usual cause for um, accidental ingestion in children. However, most cases uh, of intentional ingestion in adults either in an attempt at suicide or because they're trying to substitute it for alcohol or ethanol. Let's review the pathophysiology of ethylene glycol, both and, 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 and methanol as well. Both uh, methanol and ethylene glycol are considered toxic alcohols, uh, but the actual parent alcohols themselves, so the actual methanol and ethylene glycol aren't actually too toxic, but they are metabolized into toxic metabolites. So methanol gets metabolized into a metabolite called formate, which uh, causes optic disc hyperemia and edema, which results in permanent blindness. That makes me think maybe that's where the saying blind drunk comes from. I'm not sure. Um, further, it also causes ischemic hemorrhage, uh, uh, sorry, ischemic or hemorrhagic injury to the basal ganglia, which obviously can result in a CVA or, or death. Meanwhile, if we look to the right, we've got a, a nice little flow chart of the metabolism of ethylene glycol. Gets broken down into glycolate, then into uh, glyoxalate, and then oxalate or um, uh, oxalic acid. Uh, glyo glyoxalic acid is uh, a precursor for oxalic acid, and that is the nephrotoxic metabolite that causes uh, oliguric or anuric renal failure. Meanwhile, glycolate itself is mainly responsible for a metabolic acidosis, but it's also thought to damage renal tubules, um, as well as uh, oxalate crystals that are formed during metabolism that can also block uh, renal tubules. The, metabolite, so the metabolites of ethylene glycol cause an increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. Uh, and then you also see uh, hypocalcemia because oxalate has quite an affinity for, for calcium and then that can cause tetany seizures and so how are we going to assess a patient well again we need to try to establish how much has been ingested and obtain the packaging if possible we need to try and establish the reason for the ingestion whether it's accidental suicidal or even homicidal and if there are any co-ingestions if the patient has also taken alcohol or slash ethanol, uh, then congratulations, they've just played themselves um, and we'll explain why in a second. Uh, 
the lethal dose of either parent alcohol, so methanol or ethylene glycol, uh, is around one to two millilitres per kilogram if it's at 95% concentrated, or just about one to 1.5 grams per kilogram. Uh, but there have been cases of, uh, of serious toxicity from methanol uh, reported in ingestions of as little as one teaspoon. Um, it's important to note that inhalation and dermal exposure rarely cause problems. So that's a good scene safety tip that if you've got a patient who's managed to pour all over themselves, don't go licking them and you'll be fine. Uh, in the absence of uh, a history of ingestion, it's probably going to be pretty hard to pick um, uh, that ethylene glycol or methanol, the toxic alcohols have been ingested, but consider toxic alcohol ingestion in a patient that's got a metabolic acidosis plus an increased ionic, uh, sorry, anion gap, plus or minus an acute kidney injury. So the signs and symptoms <clears throat> change as the metabolism of the parent alcohols progress. During the first four to 12 hours, you're likely to see CNS depression and they may simply just appear drunk. Uh, tachycardia can occur, hyperventilation and hypertension can all occur as well. After 12 hours, you'll start to see evidence of nephrotoxicity. And that would be shown in blood tests where you'll probably see an elevated creatinine, for example. The hypocalcemia there will cause tetany, uh, seizures, a long QT syndrome, and you may see dysrhythmias from that. Uh, and you may also see hypotension. After 18 hours, you'll start to see severe renal failure, which will be evidenced by decreased or uh, urine output, so oliguria or no urine output, which is your anuria. Treatment at this point can still reverse the progression of the disease, but if it is not treated, beyond this point, you'll be starting to look at coma and eventual death. So how are we going to manage it? Well, again, always maintain the ABCs. If the patient's obtunded or it's just decided to tube based on how unwell they are, consider hyperventilating the patient to manage the acid-base disturbance. Sodium bicarbonate uh, can be infused and it's got, it's got, its use there is to counteract the acidosis that's generated by the toxic metabolites. It's also got the added benefit of preventing toxic acid uh, metabolite penetration of organs and it should theoretically result in decreased organ failure. And then the next little trick up the sleeve is vodka. Yeah, what the hell? So it seems pretty counterintuitive, but if we look at this next image here, we'll see exactly why. So ethanol or just normal alcohol has a greater affinity for alcohol dehydrogenase which we can see is right at the top there that is the first uh, chemical that breaks ethylene glycol into glycoaldehyde what happens is that ethanol essentially oversaturates alcohol dehydrogenase and it's unable to metabolize the other parent alcohols into their toxic metabolites because it's too busy uh, metabolizing ethanol. So for mepazol is actually pre the preferred agent here because it's actually a, a pharma, you know, it's, it's, it's a, an actual medication as opposed to just booze. Uh, but it's, it's quite expensive um, and isn't uh, isn't routinely kept in hospital stores, uh, but it is easier to use and doesn't have as many side effects. Um, obviously, intentionally inebriating your patient with alcohol does have some side effects. Um, I'm, I'm actually personally aware of two cases in South Australia where alcohol had to be urgently purchased for ethylene glycol poisoning. Uh, there was one a few years ago in a rural area where an ambulance crew had to stop at a bottle shop while on a lights and sirens trip to the emergency department with the patient uh, in order to give them uh, the antidote there. Um, and there was actually one fairly, re more, fairly recently in the area that I work in where one of the senior ED doctors had to send the police out lights and sirens with a $50 pineapple to, uh, to go to a bottle shop and buy some vodka. I'm not sure how much of the vodka was used in the emergency department as opposed to in the patient though. Um, so moving on 
uh, if those interventions don't work, uh, we can look at hemodialysis um, in hospital if there's a severe acid-based disturbance or if there are signs of severe end organ failure as well. Otherwise, management is mostly uh, supportive care in nature. Uh, so we need to prevent uh, metabolism and we essentially just need to let the body clear the poison out itself and hope that the damage at the end is minimal. So thanks uh, and as always, uh, and hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. Bye.